watch that and see what went on there. And then we will go to 1 John 5. And then like I said after that, I have a barrage of Scripture to go through after that. Um, I want to build off of this morning about thou shalt have no other gods before me. And more specifically as we dealt with Jesus being the only way to God, the one true God. And I want to build off tonight of what I want to call the doctrine of Christ. And when I speak of the doctrine of Christ, that word doctrine means teaching. But what tonight is, isn't going to be the teaching of Jesus Christ, meaning it's not what He taught. We're going to look at the doctrine of Christ Himself. Who He was. What went on. You know, why He did certain things the way that He did them. Questions that the world wonders about Christianity, but even questions that the church wonders about Christianity. And a lot of these things you're going to hear tonight are things that you need to be able to answer. You need to give account for to people that are wondering these things. But, but you know, I, I believe we need to know these things inside of Christianity. So I wanted to give you a teaching tonight a little bit deeper on the things about Christ that are important or invaluable to Christianity. And, and so bear with me as I read these. These are two very familiar passages of Scripture, and they cover what it takes for a person to be saved. So listen to these. These are good Scriptures to start out with if you're going to lead somebody to the Lord. Romans 10 and 9, one of those Roman road scriptures, right? If thou shalt confess with your what? Mouth. That's why we bring people up in an altar call, right? And I think we still need to have altar calls, right? All right. And thou shalt believe in your, your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. All right. 1 John 5 and 1 says this, Whosoever believeth that Jesus Christ is born of God, or is the Son of God, and everyone that loveth him and begat loveth him, and that loveth him also is begotten of him. And so I want to use these two passages tonight as a platform to take all this teaching through. And I want to teach to you tonight on the doctrine of Christ. And I will do my best not to preach, but it's hard for me not to preach even when I teach. But I'll try to teach, okay? And so uh, y'all just bear with me tonight. And, um, and we'll, we'll get through this. And hopefully I just cut off big pieces of steak for you to eat on tonight, okay? How many of you like steak? All right, all right. Well, we'll see if you dig in on this tonight. Amen? Bow your heads with me. Father, we ask you now to let the true teacher come. Anoint my lips to teach, Lord, and anoint the listeners, whether they're in this building or they're watching or listening in some other way. Open our eyes, Lord. Even reveal things tonight as we look into the deep truths of your word that we might not have ever recognized before. And more than that, as a pastor, tonight I ask, Lord, in the office of teacher, that you would make these individuals hungry to go dig even more, like your word says, to study, to show thyself approved. And so tonight, deep calleth out to deep. Those are your words, Lord. And so tonight, let the deep call out to those tonight that desire to go further and let them continue their study beyond tonight. We thank you, Lord. Help us divide the word with truth tonight. And we give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. The doctrine of Christ. Again, I don't want to deal with things that Jesus taught, which we're going to hear some of the words of Christ tonight because He obviously taught His own doctrine about Himself, okay? But what I want to deal with was who He was and why He had to be that way. I got to thinking this week and even had one of my associate pastors, Sister Mary, she was in the office and I was like, what do you think, let's just brainstorm this out, what do you think are some of the teachings of Christ that Christianity may not understand clearly. So we began to talk them out and write them down, and I came up with five areas tonight that I believe are vital. This isn't the only things about Christianity, and you've got to learn to classify those properly. Some things are part of our foundational beliefs that are going to save us, like these first three things we saw in Romans 10 and 1 John 5. There's three necessary components for a person to be saved according to those two Scriptures. Did you catch them in there? Number one, they have to believe that Jesus is the Lord, which means He's the Savior. He's, he, that word Jesus is Savior, okay? That's what it means. And so they have to believe that He came to die for their sin, right? Then number two, you have to believe that He rose from the dead. Isn't that what it says right here? You have to believe He died for your sins and that He rose from the dead. First John chapter 5 gives us the third element of salvation, and what is it? You have to believe that He is the, the Son of God. That's the three key categories, the three main components to Christianity. If you can't believe these, and if you can't really, I would say this to a Christian, listen, if you can't explain these to someone, then how can they get saved? 
Do, do you understand what I'm saying? And so I feel it necessary for us to look into these details tonight so you can walk away equipped to explain these things to people. It's confusing to somebody that's in the world that the Holy Spirit hadn't revealed to them why Jesus was born of a virgin. They don't understand the spiritual context of that. They have no concept of that. In fact, a woman being pregnant without conception messes them up. And so we need to be able to explain all of these things and put them out there for their purposes and for the church's purposes as well. And so I believe, according to Scripture, that a belief can get you into heaven. Right? Belief can get you to heaven. But listen to this. There is a mandate for maturity with God. You must continue to grow in the what Peter, he said this a lot, and so did Paul, in the knowledge and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That means to continually mature in your own spiritual walk. And so when you get saved, you must grow. Not just for the purpose of growth, but you know why more than any reason else that you grow? It's so you can help others come to Christ. That's the whole reason that we're here on the earth. It's to help other people get where they need to be in that situation. So, we have to be able to disciple less mature Christians. And how many of you know, unfortunately, there's less mature Christians. And so those of us that hunger and thirst to go further in our walks with God, we have two mandates that God's given us. Number one is to help disciple less mature Christians. And number two, it's to witness to lost people. Make sure they can understand this clearly. So in order for them to get this, we have to be able to get it. And there's a lot of questions that I think the church doesn't really consider when it comes to witnessing that a lot of people wonder about, even inside the church. One of them I've already covered a little bit, and I said, you know, why was Jesus born of a virgin? But here's a lot of questions I was thinking about that people have asked me at different times in the church. Now, not out of the church, but in the church. Why did Jesus have to die on a cross? Why couldn't He be shot? Why couldn't, you know, a certain situation happen besides the way it did? Why couldn't it be any other way than how it happened? Why did a man have to die instead of an animal? I've heard that one before. Questions where people wonder. And, and if we're not careful as the church, we just expect people to understand these things. And the Scriptures say that how can a person that's not spiritual understand spiritual things unless the Holy Spirit revealed them to them? And so we have to be very careful not to look at people and say, well, why don't you know that? Well, maybe they're not spiritual. And so you gotta, you got to, at some point, realize that maybe God's using you as the spiritual vessel to bring these things to them. Okay? Another question I get a lot of times is, how was Jesus both God and man? These are questions we don't think about a lot of times. They're things that subconsciously, we, we, I think we kind of categorize that it's something we need to know, but I don't know if we could really explain it to people as the church. I'm just being honest. And so I want to I wanna give you some things that I think covers our basis of Christianity t t tonight on a lot of these things and helps us understand all of the things that he did and why he had to do them. So let's begin with the first one tonight. And if you're taking notes, you can try to keep up. But there's going to be five areas that we're going to discuss tonight. The first one, and probably the longest one tonight, is the deity of Jesus Christ. Deity. Meaning this, anytime we hear the word deity, it means God. God. Was Jesus really God? Well, this one is the one's false religions just put out the door. The Muslims call him a, a good man. Some even dare inside of Israel to call him a prophet. But they will not accept the term that he was God. And so we, wanna, we, we want to really go through this and be able to walk you through things tonight and give you a platform for this. And this is where... If I have some pride in the assemblies of God, I'm very proud of our fellowship because this, the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, is one of our 16 fundamental truths. We believe Jesus was God from the very beginning, and then He became the only begotten Son of God manifested in human form. And we have all of this in our foundational truths in the assemblies. You cannot be a minister of the gospel in the assemblies without believing this doctrine right here. A lot of our ministers, unfortunately, can't even explain this doctrine. They just say He was God. He was the Son of God. But they can't give validation to why. And so, I want to walk you through this, and, and let me establish this out of Scripture. Again, I tell you all the time, and all you Bible students that are coming up to be preachers, always remember this. Illustrations are good. They are. But the greatest illustration is the Bible. Use the Bible to illustrate every point that you want to prove, and you'll never go wrong. Ever. And so, listen to this. Did Jesus really come from God? 
Well, I used this scripture this morning just briefly when I quoted it to you. We used it Wednesday night in spiritual warfare. John chapter 1, verse 1. You all know this scripture by heart yet? I'm quoting it all the time to you. In the beginning was the what? The Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we see key components here. Going down to the 14th verse, the Word was made. Come on. This is teaching night, so you can help me, okay? The Word became flesh. I'm trying to pinch here. Hallelujah. And it dwelt among us. And look what it says in parentheses. We beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We hear this used and read, and when we take it a little bit further scripturally and we establish it, John 1 and 1, when we read that, it said this, in the beginning, saw that there on John 1 1, in the beginning was the Word. So if we really want to get a concise understanding of Jesus was the Son of God, we need to track all of this down, since it says in the beginning the Word was there with God, He was God, and it was always there with Him. And then it says that that Word became flesh, and we need to go back to the very beginning and since it says the Word was there in the beginning, and let's see if the Bible proves that Jesus was there. That's going to be the easiest way to do this, almost like a detective. Let's find out if He was really there in the beginning, like it says, because if He was there in the beginning, then there's no argument at all that He wasn't God. You following that? So let's look at it. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Let's see if we can catch Jesus in the beginning. Genesis 1 is when God's creating everything. 7 Literal days, or six rather, seven on a rest day, but six literal days, not six 1,000 year periods like some teach. It was six literal days that God did the work of creation. And it says here in verse 26, God said, catch these words, let us make man in our image. Huh. Now maybe I'm crazy. Don't amen that part. And maybe I went to Liberty Hollow and, and my education ain't up to par. I'm not as educated as some of y'all out here from Bloomberg, Charles. But last I knew, let us make man in our image means that somebody else is present besides God. And the last I knew, according to the way I'm reading it, man ain't there yet. And the last I knew, according to what I read in my Bible, None of us look like the angels I've read about in the Bible. In fact, if you look in Scripture, angels change their form to look human. And so anytime they're in a human form and we see them in that sense represented in the Bible, Paul even said it still happens today in the New Testament where men have entertained angels and they never even knew about it because they were in human form. They, 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 they changed their form. It even says Satan's ministers do that today. Read it. It's in Scripture. It says, Satan himself can masquerade as a child of light. Wow. And so we see here that God's talking to somebody. He's speaking to Let us make man in our image. He's not talking to the angels. He's not to, even though they Never mind, I'll leave that alone. He's not talking to other people because Adam and Eve were going to be the very first people ever created. Some might say, how do we know that they were the only ones? Paul called him the first man. He was the first man on the earth. That's what it says about, about Adam in the beginning. And so what we see here is God speaking to someone. Let's clarify who that is from Scripture. Because I want to show you who all was present at creation. Genesis 1 verse 2. Back up a few verses here. And it says this. You know the first, the first verse, right? In the beginning. Didn't it start out like that? God said, let there... Be like. It goes on to verse 2. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep. Listen here. And the Spirit of God. Guess who that is? It's the Holy Spirit. That's, it doesn't take a theologian to figure this out. So we see God in Genesis 1.1. God the Father saying, let there be. We see the Holy Spirit, the second person of the Godhead, in operation at creation, holding the waters together as the earth was being formed or about to be formed by God. You see where this is at. Turn to Colossians, or just keep up with me rather, because I'm fixing to be running through Scripture. Colossians chapter 1, we get this in verses 13 through 16. Speaking of Jesus Christ, listen to what it says. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, has translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. Now speaking of Christ, look here. In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Right? He's talking about Jesus. 
Look what it says. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Check this one out. For by Him, who is it talking about? Jesus, right? We see God the Father in Genesis 1.1. We see the Holy Spirit in Genesis 1.2. Now listen, speaking of Jesus, listen to what it says in Colossians. For by Him, let's just input Jesus since He was who it was talking about. For Jesus created all things. Look at that. Jesus created all things that are in heaven and that are in where? Earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. So we see with this right here that the Godhead was involved with creation, all three parties. We see God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit doing each part of the work that was necessary at creation. And we still see those three in operation still today as God is working out redemption's plan in our lives and we have the Godhead operating. So is Jesus really the Son of God? Can we really say that He is the Son of God? Well, let's go back to Scripture again now that we know that He was there in the very beginning. Are we clear on that part? You see He was there in the beginning? Okay, let's go backwards then. In the beginning was the Word. Are we clear He was there in the beginning, church? Okay. I can hear the people that are watching screaming, Yes, we got it! So is Jesus really the Son of God? Isaiah chapter 9. We hear this around Christmas time a lot. But listen to what it says in verse 6. For unto us a child is born. We're going to key in on the word son now. Unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulders. Listen to what the names of him are going to be called. And we'll see if he is the son of God. Wonderful, counselor, the mighty, God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. So it says a child's going to be born clarifies that it will be a boy, a son will be given, and his name, his title, will be Everlasting God. Very clear here. Demons even called Jesus the Son of God. Not just once, numerous times in the Gospels. I'm going to show you different individuals here. Matthew 8 and 29, it says, Behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? The disciples called Him the Son of God. Matthew 14 and 33, it says that they were in the ship, came and they worshipped Him after He had went out. This was the second time He's walking on water. They're out there with Him. And it says this, Of a truth thou art the Son of God. Help me tonight. The Roman guards, the centurions that put Him on the cross believed He was the Son of God. Look at this in Matthew 27, 54. When the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. The angel that came to pronounce to Mary that she was going to have a baby conceived of the Holy Spirit pronounced that Jesus would be the Son of God. Listen, Luke 1 and 35, the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost will come upon you, the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of you will be called the Son of God. The lineage is traced, even in the two passages where we find the lineage of Jesus Christ through Joseph, his non-natural father, even though they traced it all the way back for Israel's sake, and then his natural birth mother, Mary, the lineage is traced back for her. Listen to the end of the lineage, Luke 3 and 38. Who was the son of Enoch, who was the son of Seth, who was the son of Adam, who was the son of God. Jesus even confirmed this about Himself, that He was the Son of God. Luke 22 and 70. It says, then they all that were there said, are you the Son of God? And he said this, and unfortunately the King James Version of this doesn't clarify what it actually means right here. It makes it look like he's saying, you're the one that's saying that. But what it actually says here in the original writing, it says, ye say that I am, meaning what you say is truth. So he clarified to them, I am in fact the Son of God. And at this point is when they decided he's getting crucified, there's no turning back. We're going to kill him because of that. And so it was the last straw. 
And so we have to, we see this um, not just in all these scriptures I've given you, but how about all the scriptures we read about in John chapter 3 and other locations where he calls him the begotten Son of God? Like I read this morning in John 3 16, that, that he sent his only begotten Son. We see those. How about when God, like you heard this morning, would clarify to people by audible voice, This is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. Not once, but twice that happened where individuals heard this. And so He is truly the Son of God, the only Son of the living God. All throughout the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, the Apostle James, they would call Him the Son of God. If you look all through Scripture, it's there. So there's no doubt at all. Not only was He the Son of God, but He was the second person or is the second person in the triune Godhead. What we understand as the Trinity. But here's something else we need to understand about the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was fully God, but He was fully man. It's confusing. If you really think hard about it, it starts to bring a little confusion. And this rattles some people, and so I want to describe this and put it out for you tonight. So was Jesus both God and man? Philippians, let's go to Scripture again. Chapter 2. Beginning in verse 5, reading down to about the 8th verse. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Listen to what happens. Who being in the form of God, look at that, one part who? Come on. Being in the form of whom? God. Thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He's not saying he was equivalent to God. He's saying that he knew he was the Son of God, and so he didn't hide behind that. He made himself of no reputation. He took on the form of a servant. Speaking of humanity now, listen, it's going to make it clear. He was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and he became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. So we see he was fully God, but he was fully who? Man, humanity. And so this passage, we see that what God did, Christ, he did, and I have to kind of, I'm simple, so I kind of picture this in my mind. When I see God the Father in the Old Testament a lot of times, you see whether if it was Moses or other individuals, Abraham even, they would plead with God for humanity. Intercessory prayer. They would stand in the gap and God would change His mind, it looks like in Scripture, where He would want to destroy mankind. Well, we see, in my mind, I visualize Jesus in that same position where God would frustrate when Adam and Eve fell. He knew what was going on even though the Lamb was slain. I believe that's why the Scripture was written that the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world because even though He knew man would end up the way He did, Jesus would step up and say, Dad, I'll go on their part and I will make sure that the price gets paid one day. And so I have to believe that He stood there for us. The Bible talks about His substitutionary work for me and you and His mediation for us. But Jesus left His God form, if you want to call it that, I don't know the best way to describe this. And he purposefully took on human qualities. Purposefully. He hungered. He thirsted. He tired. Think about it. He felt every human quality and emotion that we feel. Every part of it. So what Jesus did was he laid aside the expression of his deity. What do you mean the expression of his deity? The qualities that made him God. You know what those three qualities are? Omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence. He laid those aside. What it meant was he laid aside his power, his omnipotence. He decided and determined, I'll take on humanity with all of its weaknesses, with all the things that go on inside of being a human being. I will purposely lay aside all the power that I hold. And we see that he did that. Remember in Scripture it says, at any point in time he could have called 10,000 legions of angels to deliver him, yet he never did it. He laid his omnipotence aside. He laid his omniscience aside. What does that mean? It means that he wasn't all-knowing. That was a God quality that he purposefully laid aside to become like a man. Because whether you realize it or not, you don't know everything. Somebody amen that tonight. None of us do. But God does. And in order for Christ to become a human, he had to humble himself to the place of accepting that he wasn't going to know all things. Scripture tells us that when he would meet people, it would use these words like this. He perceived what was in their heart. You know what that is? That's the holy, that, that's the gifts of the Spirit that we read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, about a word of knowledge and a word of wisdom. He was discerning. 
It even says that there was at times where he wasn't reading their minds as God. The Holy Spirit was revealing things to him, just like he does you guys when you meet someone or thoughts start coming into your mind that you know aren't coming from you, that they're coming from the Holy Spirit. Christ laid that expression of himself aside to be a human. The other one he laid aside was omnipresence, meaning he couldn't be everywhere at once. Jesus was not in Samaria and Jerusalem at the exact same time. He was either one or the other. He laid that part of his deity aside. Now, God the Father's always been omnipresent. He's everywhere. You call on him, he's there. He's right there. He can be in Korea and Texas at the same time. Jesus gave that up when he became human. He chose to do that. He chose to come here and do that. So he continued to be fully God, but he never used his God qualities because he took on human form. I guess one of the best representations of this is in the temptation in the garden, or not the garden, but in the wilderness, when he was there for 40 days and 40 nights, he had just finished fasting. If you think about the things that we just talked about, omnipresence, omnipotence, and, and omniscience, those are the things Satan was trying to get him to do. He was trying to get him to use his power as God, omnipotence, for his own benefit and his own desire. That's what a sin really is. That's what Adam did. Is eating a fruit off a tree really a sin? Well, we understand it is when God says don't do it. But really what happened was he was overcome by self-desire and self-gratification, and he used the power that God had given him to satisfy something in himself. That's the temptation for every one of us. We've got to quit looking at the symptoms. We need to get to the roots of the problem and let it, let it be what it needs to be. So we see that he never laid aside either. I'll say he never, he never quit being God. He never quit being human while he was here. He was always those things because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But he purposefully, you didn't say that in Philippians right here when I read it? He made himself of no reputation. He purposed to lay aside those qualities. I think about this when I consider what we're just talking about. Why would he choose to do it like that? But think about what he did when he came. What happened when he got baptized in water? He came up out of the water. Do you remember what happened? There was a heavenly voice. This is my son. But what else happened at that place in the Jordan River? Something began to descend down. What? Well, the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove, right? People, that's John the Baptist described it as it looked like a dove coming down. The Holy Spirit came down upon him. Now, he was God, was he not? But he decided to take the reputation in the form of a human. So he laid all his power aside. So guess what power he had to depend on now? The Holy Spirit coming down. It probably looks really weird doing that. But the Holy Spirit coming and living in him and empowering him, just like we believe in Acts chapter 1. You know, and some people are like, well, did Jesus speak in tongues? It really, that doesn't even matter. It's not even relevant, okay? It's really not. He didn't need a heavenly language because he was connected right to the Father. He doesn't even need that, all right? But here's the thing. If Jesus in his humanity leaned and depended on the power of the Holy Spirit to do everything that he did, who are we as the church to think that it's not necessary for us? Consider that. He set the pattern for me and you. He didn't have to convert because he was perfect. He didn't have to repent because he had never committed a sin, which we'll cover in just a moment. But what, we, what he did is he set in place a pattern that we would all follow as a great leader does. He didn't have any expectations that he wouldn't go through himself. He even submitted himself to water baptism. Never committed a sin. So all those people that think water baptism cleanses them from sin is wrong because when Jesus got baptized, he didn't have nothing to do with sin because he was sinless. All right, And then he received the power of the Holy Spirit. It says immediately he was led to be tempted. After that, he came out in the power. Excuse me, the power of the Spirit is what it says. And then, and only then, he began to do miracles. And he began to preach. He had never preached, taught, or performed a miracle until after the Holy Spirit moved upon him. Isn't that interesting as it pertains to our Christianity and our walks with God? Because it was the exact same way with the disciples. After the day of Pentecost took place at Acts chapter 2, the disciples went out themselves, and 120, and they began to perform miracles and boldly proclaim the Word of God, just as Jesus did. So that's a little side note for you. So let's get into the next one here. What about the virgin birth? Why is the virgin birth so important to what we believe? And we have to be careful on this one, and I, I know it. sometimes it may sound like that I'm badgering other belief systems, and I'm not. But I just I firmly believe that we live in a time right now, guys, 
that truth has to be called truth and declared truth. And so regardless of what others teach, we need to teach what the Word of God says about a matter. And, and there's movements out there that magnify Mary over Jesus. You don't have to think very far to understand what I'm talking about right now. They even pray to her. They have statues in their homes of her and they pray to the Virgin Mary. I don't even... Oh, that's another side note. Anyways, the teaching is very important to understand why Jesus was born of a virgin because listen to this. If you can't grasp this concept that you're going to hear, you can never walk in the victory that God expects you to walk in as a Christian. It is connected to that. What do you mean, preacher? Let's go back to the fall of man. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I, I was quoting this this morning to you, but listen to what it says. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And he's speaking of Satan here. I will bruise, or you'll bruise his head, but he, or no, he will bruise your head, sorry, and you will bruise his heel. This is God telling Satan one day that there'd be a seed that came not from a man, but from whom? The woman right here. And like I said this morning, it's interesting because the woman doesn't carry the seed of life, the man does. And so with God declaring this from the very beginning, we see a powerful truth in late in Scripture at the fall of mankind that God somehow was going to produce a miraculous birth to provide victory against the adversary of humanity. It says that that enmity would come, or that, that seed would come and have enmity with the, with the evil one or with Satan. But since the woman has no seed, and the seed of life was carried by man, that God was going to have to handle this on His own. Let's track it all the way back through Scripture, and I want to see if the Redeemer really came this way, and if He really showed up this way, and why this is so important as we see this as pertaining to the seed of woman not being there and the seed of man being there. So I want to track it back through Scripture. Listen to this. It gets interesting. I hope I'm not losing you. You okay? Psalm 51 and 5 says this. This is, this is why what we're going to build up to why He had to be born of a virgin. That's the question I asked, right? Listen to what it says about every normal, natural human being that's ever born. Psalm 51 and 5, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. This is not speaking of at the moment the baby was made that she was committing a sin. This is speaking of the fact that when the baby was born or conceived into the womb, as a man placed him there, that he was born under the curse of Adam. Original sin. The sin nature. Whatever you want to call it by name. It's, it's passed down from generation to generation, from Adam all the way to every one of us that sit here today. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 clarifies it a little more. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world. Speaking of Adam. And death came by sin. So death passed upon all men that... Biggest word in English, that all have sinned. This tells us right here. Psalm 51.5 says that the seed of sin is passed from man to man. When a human is born, they're born into sin. Romans right here in, in chapter 5 says that since sin is passed down from generation to generation, death is a reality and now all have sinned just because they're born the way that they are. So listen, here's what I'll clarify. Because I know right now there's something going on in our society where they hear that born that way. The homosexuals try to grab that and say, well, I'm born this way. No, you're not born a homosexual. You're born a sinner. Something happens in your life to gravitate you towards that sin. Let's call it a bend. Something bends you towards it. There's something that happens in your life that directs you to that particular sin where it dominates your life. There's not a person in this lifetime. And here's the deal. I'll say it to you like this. My father, I've shared my personal story with you, but my father, who I grew up with, was my adopted father, and he was an extreme alcoholic. He did not conceive me, neither was I in his family line. But listen to this, I did the same sins he did because I saw him do them every single day. So it's not something that's passed down generationally. What's passed down is at the moment of birth, we need a Savior. We're born into sin. We understand this, right? And so, since man is the one that carries the seed of humanity and passes this down, and Adam passed it down to all humanity, then Jesus coming to earth without the seed of man, was necessary. So He wasn't born in the likeness of man. He was born in the likeness of Adam. 
Don't let me lose you there. How was Adam made in the very beginning? God created him. He wasn't created by a man. Adam was not perfect. The Bible calls him good. God looked on all that he had made and he called it different than perfect. Good. Perfect meant it'll never mess up. Good meant there's an opportunity and he's going to get a choice. Good meant that there, it could be a possibility because he's going to be given an option. And Adam, we understand the whole process with him and Eve and what took place there. And then it began to pass down from time to time after that. And I said a moment ago that Jesus was made in the likeness of Adam. Read what the Apostle Paul teaches in the letters to the churches. He even goes as far as calling Jesus the second Adam. I'm not just making this up, church. It's in Scripture that He's the second Adam. That God sent Him, not by man, but God Himself conceived Jesus in human form. Not in the sense of what we think about of making a conception with a woman. It says that the Holy Ghost moved upon Mary and that God would put that child inside of her. There was no sexual intercourse involved. That is gross and blasphemous if people say that stuff. It wasn't that way. God placed him into the womb, and just like he had made Adam, he made Jesus in the likeness of man. But Jesus being born of a virgin guaranteed this. He did not have a sin nature. That is critical. He did not have a sin nature. Does that mean he couldn't have sinned? No. It's not what it means. How do we know? He was made in the likeness of Adam. He's the second Adam. First Adam was made in the likeness of God as well, right? Let us make man in our image. Created out of the image of God. Adam didn't have a sin nature. You do get that. He was the father of humanity. What he passed down after that, created in us, and a sin nature came about. But Adam did not have a sin nature. Once he fell to the depravity of sin and he gave in to self-desire, something created in humanity. And some will say, well, it takes time before people get that bad. Friend, did you know that their first baby, their firstborn son was a murderer in the first generation after that Adam committed a sin? The first generation. It didn't take years. It didn't even take the alcohol influence or the drug influence. It didn't take him being raised in a bad home. The sin nature was so strong in Cain that he killed his own brother because of an offering. And God told him, I don't accept what you've offered me. Happened in one generation. And so we see that it was imperative for God when He sent His Son to come that He would become a man, but He had to be in the likeness of Adam without a sin nature. It didn't mean He couldn't sin. It just meant that He was going to have the choice just like Adam did. And He was sent... If you really understand redemption, Jesus was sent to fulfill the original obligation of Adam. Still here, church? Told you I'm cutting off some steak for you tonight. Some good stuff. So we leave from this to fulfill God's original plan. And the only way He could fulfill the original plan without a sin nature is if He remained sinless. He had to live a sinless life. That's the next part of what I want to talk about. The sinless life. This is vital because you do realize tonight if Jesus ever committed a sin, it was all over. Don't you think if the devil could get anybody to fall, he was going to try to get him to fall? Especially once Satan knew. He didn't know what time Jesus was going to show up on the earth. But once he did know, and demons begin to call out and say, you're the son of God, you better know Satan knew it. How many times did he say that even in the wilderness temptation that we talked about? Every time that he spoke to Jesus in the wilderness, he used those words. If thou be the Son of God. He knew. He was just trying to get him to fall. And that wasn't the only temptation of Jesus. It would have been there numerous times. Not just in a wilderness, but how about on the cross or when they were beating him? Or how good have we, I mean, how would we have been able to handle such a thing? Ripping the beard out of his face. I don't know if we would have had the strength to do what Jesus did. Not to ever say a word, but live a completely and entirely sinless life. So the virgin birth connects to the sinless life. Without being born into humanity like us, then He wasn't born into sin. Therefore, He had the opportunity to go through life without a blemish. It's important because without a sinless life, there's not a spotless offering. Without a spotless offering, there is no sacrifice for sin. It was the demand. I'm going to walk you through all of this. 
I'm going to try to in a timely manner. Hallelujah. So Jesus did this. He lived a sinless life. How do we know? Let's go to Scripture again. Let's find out. Hebrews 2 and 18 says this, and then we'll skip four, or two chapters back to, to the fourth chapter also. For He Himself, speaking of Christ, has suffered being tempted. He is able to help me and you that are being tempted. Now, isn't that good news? We're not praying or talking to a statue with a big old belly and asking Him for help, and He ain't never been through nothing. We ain't talking to Allah who ain't never been through nothing, who's never had some type of mental or emotional thing going on in their life like we get to. We're talking to Christ who became man, who felt what we feel. How do you know He felt what we feel like the Scripture says? Not only does it say it right here, but I said illustrate Scripture with Scripture, right? Here's what happened. Remember when He's in the garden praying in the Garden of Gethsemane right before His arrest? The Bible says He prayed so hard blood came out of His forehead. Some will try to say, oh, it's just a metaphor, that he was sweating so much. No, it says he literally prayed until blood was coming out of his forehead. That man was intensely praying. He was praying hard. And you know why? He kept waking those disciples up because he couldn't even get the ones closest to him to go to a prayer meeting with him. He kept waking them up all the time saying, listen, disciples, I need you right now because my spirit's willing but my flesh is weak. I'm struggling with this. He even asked God, take this cup from me so I don't have to drink of it. If I don't have to go to the cross, let it be another way. Nevertheless, that's the kind of praying we need to get to in our praying. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. That's where we need to get to every time we pray about a matter. It's God, it doesn't matter what I want. It matters what you want. And so if the cross is what you want, the cross is what I'll do. And we've got to get ourselves to that place. But he was tempted. So he, I like this, that big word, secure. He's able to secure. He's able to help us when we're tempted. Why? Because a good leader faces the things that his followers are going to face so he can give them answers and he can give them help. That's why he's a shepherd and not a cowboy. Cowboys push a herd. Shepherds lead a herd. Shepherds get out front and turn around and say, come on guys, it's okay, I've already been here. That's what he does for us. Hebrews 4, did he live a sinless life? Are you liking this church? All right, Hebrews 4, verse 15. We don't have a high priest. Like, yeah, you've heard this. Which cannot be touched by the feelings of our infirmities. I like that. He's been through what we've been through, so He feels with us when we feel. Look at the last part. Was He without sin? He was at all points tempted like as we are, yet was without sin. Clarified right here in Scripture. He lived a perfect life without sin. He never ran off to France with Mary Magdalene. He didn't have a baby that's called the Holy Grail. It's all that stuff's out there. He didn't ever have intercourse with anyone. It would have been a sin because he was never married. He, it, none of that ever happened in his lifetime. Jesus says, the, or, or just as the Old Testament priest had to inspect the lamb for the offering in the Old Testament, it couldn't have a spot or blemish anywhere. Do you know if there was one hair that was another color besides the rest of the color on a lamb or a bull or a goat when it was brought, it would be rejected by the priest? If they brought their lame bull, if it, had, if it was the bull that had the limp, the priest would turn it away. They were demanded by God to bring the best one they had out of their herd when they brought an offering. And just like in that Old Testament, Jesus too had to be without sin. He had to be perfect without a blemish. God couldn't accept a marred sacrifice. Another type or a shadow that you see in the Old Testament about Christ and His ministry on the cross. But what does this sinless life bring me and you? Romans 5 again. Different verse. Verse 19. By one man's disobedience, who was that? Adam. We were all made what? Sinners. Then the obedience of one, who is that? Jesus Christ. Many will be made righteous. The Bible goes on to call me and you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We don't ever get righteous. In fact, the, the book of Isaiah tells us that our righteousness is as what? Filthy rags. You know, in the Hebrew, I'm not trying to be gross or, or anything like that, but in the Hebrew writing, do you know that, that that word filthy rag actually is interpreted menstrual rags? Dirty menstrual rags. That's how God views the best thing a human can do. That's what it says in Scripture. Our righteousness 
as His filthy rags. Romans goes on and says that there's none righteous. No, not one. We see this. So God would send His Son to live a sinless life. In doing so, He would fulfill or complete the obligation that God had in the law. The structure of rules and doing this and doing that and not doing this and not doing that. And when He did that, He would become our righteousness. So now when we believe on Christ and His sinless life through a virgin birth, you see how they're all connecting now? When we believe on Him as the Lord Jesus Christ and that He lived this life just like it says, we're not given righteousness. The Bible teaches us that we're now standing in the position of righteousness. That's what it means to be in Christ Jesus. If we're not righteous, no, not one, how could He just hand us righteousness and expect us to do good with it? Yeah, that's how the church operates. I'll just go do something and it makes me good. There's nothing in us that's good except the Holy Spirit if we're saved. And so then righteousness becomes a positional thing. It's all about I'm standing here because I believe Jesus did something for me. And if I leave this by any other means, I'm not in the position of righteousness anymore. I'm not seen as holy in God's eyes anymore. I'm never holy and I'm never good and I'm never righteous unless I'm right here where He expects me to be hidden, like Paul said, hidden in Christ. That's what Paul said when he meant this. He wrote this and he said, For I'm crucified with Christ. Know what he says? Nevertheless, I live. Not I, but the faith I, or the life I now live is live by faith in the Son of God. Now what it says? Galatians, go read it, chapter 2. That's what he says. So we have to learn how to, listen, properly maintain relationship with the Father so we stay in the right position with Christ. If we ever depart this spot, and it's easy because we're works people, man. It's really easy. If we leave this spot, and say, I'll go do this, even though it's a good thing. It may not be righteous. That's where you've heard me say, just because things are good doesn't mean they're God. We add another O in there, and it makes us go, oh, in the end, because I just made that up. And it's really not any good. That's why y'all didn't laugh, is because it was terrible. So His obedience is handed to us through the power of the Holy Spirit living in us. That's why it's necessary for God to come live in us. Do you know that He can only live in us? Listen. The Holy Spirit only comes into us when we're in proper position. It's not a demand we make of God and say, meet me here or here. That's why Ephesians tells us, for it is by grace through faith which we're saved, not by works, lest any man should boast. He tells us when you're in the right position, faith in grace, faith in Christ and what He did for me, and grace meaning I accept the free gift. I can't do anything to get it, but Lord, I believe, so give it to me. I'm in the position. Now I can receive the Holy Spirit to live inside of me. God, not an emotion, not just the heebie-jeebies and a feeling. God, the Holy Ghost, the third party that hovered over the waters and kept the earth together. That God, He's in me now just because I'm in this position. And you know what He does now? Another big church word, sanctification. He starts taking me in the position I'm in and changing my condition to match the righteousness that God has placed on my life. That's what sanctification is. He changes the vessel and He purges the vessel and He keeps working in me. Philippians chapter 1, He that hath begun a perfect work will complete it in the day of the Lord. Meaning that one day the work will be done. It ain't going to be on this earth. I'm going to already be floating a little bit when He gives me my glorified body. But that's when it's going to be completed is in that day. But as long as I remain in the proper position by faith, the Holy Spirit will start changing my condition. We're here on this earth the position I stand in of righteousness by the power of the Holy Spirit will start being revealed to other people and they'll see my condition change. And I'm not even doing it. All I'm doing is standing in the position that He told me to stand in. You see in this, we're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It actually goes on further in two other passages and tells you that we were created His righteousness this way. He's placed His righteousness up on us so we can do the works that need to be done. The works don't make righteousness. Righteousness makes works. Did you hear me? Works don't make you righteousness. Righteousness produces works. That's what James was saying. You show me your faith, your works, your faith without works, I'll show you mine with works. He's telling you the proper procedure or process that's necessary in a child of God's life. He's saying, you go on and do what you think you need to do and don't show anything, and that's not God at all. He said, but I'll show you that if I'm in proper faith, works will follow. 
So proper faith is always going to bring proper works. Sinless life then leads us to sacrifice. So we've got the virgin birth, sinless life, and now we get into the sacrifice. We're almost there, y'all. Somebody say amen. I, I think I put you to sleep already. We understand that Jesus came to die, but sometimes I think what we don't get is why did he have to die how he died? Why did it have to be a cross? Why did he have to get beaten? Why did it have to be the way that it did? Why couldn't it have been another method? Why couldn't animal sacrifice take care of the mandate that God had so an offering of an animal's blood could cover sin? If we're not careful, these are things we don't think about. But these are things the world does think about. False religions don't understand it. They don't understand how God became a man, hung on a cross, and saves people. They don't understand this, so the church needs to understand this. So let's look at the sacrifice. I want to talk to you beginning in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, why the mandate was blood. Listen to what it says here. For the life of the flesh is what? In the blood. And listen to what God says about it. Here's His decree. I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. And so where the blood was the requirement of God that He set out that would bring atonement for sin, animal blood served only as a picture of what Jesus would come do one day on the cross. According to Scripture, this is exactly what took place. Hebrews chapter 9, listen to what it says beginning in verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by His own blood. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling of the unclean sanctifieth it to purging or purifying of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from the dead works to serve the living God? Three reasons that animal sacrifice could not work in God's eyes. Number one, the offering system was designed to keep the Israelite and their mind on from generation to generation that a Redeemer was going to come. That's what it was all about. It was a picture. It was telling them that one day this is going to happen, a prophecy to them. But they were having it lived out in their life every single day. They were seeing it nonstop. Number two, the reason why an offering system wouldn't work the way it was set out in the Old Testament was it because the offering system was designed for a man to realize their accountability before God with sin and continue in fellowship with Him. Meaning this, you sin, you bring an offering, and when you bring an offering, you get to stand right standing with me. That can't be the way it is with Christ because it's done on human terms. You see how I'm saying? Every time a man brought an offering, even though it was what God demanded, the priest still had an offer and offering over that one at the end of the day for him to be relevant. And the priest was standing in the place or the picture of the high priest Christ who would come according to Hebrews and fulfill the obligation of the priesthood himself with whose blood? His own blood, right? And go into the holy place himself right before the throne of God and he would make sure that everything was done with his own sinless, spotless blood. Here's an interesting thought. The third reason that animal sacrifice wouldn't work is because the animal didn't commit a sin, a human did. Why is that important? Atonement can't be granted for a soul by something without a soul. Simple. Animals don't have souls. They have spirits. Not like we understand. They have a consciousness. But they don't have what we know as a soul. God didn't breathe into their nostrils. And they became a living soul, like it says in Scripture. It says when he created the animals, he just said, you're there. Adam got to name them. He wasn't a caveman. He, he was created in the image of God. He had God's wisdom and God's mind. He named everything as we know it today. And it even says it in the beginning. There was cattle and birds, and he named them all. But an animal can't atone for man because man was the one that sinned. Therefore, somehow, man had to produce redemption. Man couldn't produce redemption, though. Every time man touched something, it was flawed. Anything man has extended into is unrighteous. It's unholy. That's why God has to recreate the entire earth in the end. Because man has been there. I don't even know how far out he's going to have to stretch into the heavens for where our spacecrafts have been. 
and our satellites and our space stations. But He's going to have to go everywhere that man's presence has been. Anything that man has touched has got to be recreated, refurbished, purged because of sin. An animal couldn't do away with this. Therefore, Jesus, God, His Son, took on the likeness of a human coming through a virgin, came to the earth, lived a sinless life, presented Himself as the sacrifice and the offering for all humanity and sin was cast away forever. As far as east is, from the west. Never to be remembered again. But why a cross? Why not a quick death? I mean, God, it would have been much more merciful for your son to just die and it been over with. Why did he have to go to the cross? There's no doubt that the altar of the Old Testament was a bloody and a very awful spectacle. If you would have walked up on the altar, there would have been so much on display that it would have broken your heart. To hear uh, the bleeding of a lamb as its throat was cut, could you imagine the sounds coming out of the altar? The blood and everything that was going on, it wasn't a beautiful place. And remember, church, that that picture was painted. It was set out for God to put it in the minds of anyone that would ever believe the spectacle that was going to take place when the Lamb of God came. It wasn't, going to be, it wasn't going to be a pretty picture. It wasn't going to be easy for Christ to endure what had to been endured for sin to be wiped out. In fact, it was so difficult. Even though He was beaten, nails put through His hands. The worst moment of Christ's life on the earth wasn't hanging on a cross. It wasn't having His beard ripped out. It wasn't having the coat ripped off His back after His blood had scabbed to it and they ripped it all back open. It wasn't all of those things. You know the worst part of Jesus hanging on the cross? Wasn't looking at His mama and the Apostle John. It was looking up to heaven and saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, why have you forsaken me? The earth went dark for three hours in the middle of the day. Because the Bible teaches that all the sin of humanity was placed upon Jesus at that point on the cross. And that God in all of His holiness could not look down on His own Son because the sin of the world rested upon Him. Read the Old Testament system and what went on. When the lamb was brought, there was two goats a year brought to the, the high priest. One of them would be offered as a sin offering. The other one would be called the, the trespass or even this. They called it the scapegoat. And the very first thing they would do is they'd bring that scapegoat up and all the sins of Israel were spoken by mouth. I don't even know how they picked them all. But they were spoken over the high priest's hands. And the high priest would put his hands on that scapegoat. Transferring. Listen to this. Substituting through that goat all the sins of Israel. And then they would tie a bell around its neck and they would send it off into the wilderness. So anybody that was out in the field that heard the tinkling of that bell was immediately reminded that one day my sins are going to be taken away by someone taking my place. And they still didn't get it even when He was standing right in front of them. Even when He was pouring it all out on the cross, they still didn't get it. He was standing right in front of them. The cross was the only display that could have accurately portrayed what God intended through the sacrificial offering system. It's the only way. Theologians and historians say that there's not a method today, even today with all the technology and all the things that man has made themselves capable of doing, that dying on a cross is still the most brutal death that a person can ever endure. You literally, you know you don't die from hanging. You don't die from blood loss. You die from suffocating to death. That's got to be the worst way to die. I've had to drown before in water combat survival training. And it is the hardest thing to ever do is to know what you're about to do and take your last breath full of water and then get the water out of your lungs. It's so hard to do. But I can't imagine hanging there until my breath leaves my body. And the interesting thing about what Jesus did, remember He said, nobody's taking my life from me. I'm laying it down. And He said, I will breathe my last breath. And that's what He did. And said, it is finished. And he gave up the ghost. He did it on his terms, knowing that he accomplished what he said he was going to do. But what many don't know is that the prophets foretold the cross. Did you know that? 
That's another reason why he had to die on the cross. Not only was it the best portrayal of the sacrificial offering system, but God spoke through prophets and said that it would be this way. Therefore, he had to die on the cross or the word of God wasn't going to be true. Where does it say all this? I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping it up, guys. Isaiah 50 and 6, listen to this. I gave my back to the smiters, my cheeks to them that plucked out my hair. Look at that, all the people that think holy people can't have hair on their face. Jesus had it. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. He allowed them to do this. Isaiah 53 and 3, the great chapter of the crucifixion in Isaiah. Listen to what it says. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid our faces from him. And he was despised and esteemed him not. Verse 5, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Verses 7 through 10, as you read this, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he never opened his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before his shears is dumb. He openeth not his mouth. I wonder if we're that way when people do things to us. That's another message. Verse 8, he was taken from prison and from judgment. Is this not what happened? Did he not get locked up with Pilate? The Romans took him in prison. The Jews locked him up. Herod questioned him. Pilate questioned him. He was beaten every time when he entered and when he exited every one of those locations. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. He, listen, you remember who Joseph of Arimathea is? Okay, let me give you some Bible knowledge. You, Pastor, I hope you know who that is. Joseph of Arimathea was the man that Jesus had led who was a Pharisee, rich man, Pharisee. He had been born again. After his death, Joseph offered his own tomb. He went back with Mary, the mother, and Mary and Martha, got Jesus off of the cross and said, let's put him in my tomb. Hundreds, 700 years before that ever took place. Listen to this. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. The Bible records Joseph of Arimathea being a rich man. And it speaks of Jesus being buried with the rich. Hmm. Because he had done no violence. Look, that mentions he was sinless. Neither was any deceit in his mouth. Verse 10, listen to this. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Remember what Leviticus 19 said a moment ago? Or 17, sorry, Leviticus 17. For the life of the flesh is in the blood and it will be an offering on the altar for the atonement of the what? The soul. It says right here, he will make his soul, an offering for sin. That's why animal sacrifice couldn't work. It had to be a soul. It had to be a man. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And that's speaking of the millennial reign one day when he takes his place on the throne in Jerusalem for a thousand years. Psalms twenty-two, fourteen, and 15. David had no idea what words he was penning as the Holy Spirit moved upon him and he wrote these words down. But listen to this. I'm poured out like water. What happened when they poked the spear through the side of Jesus after he had died? It says blood and water poured out. All my bones are out of joint. He never broke a bone. That's what it even says about him on the cross, that he would never break a bone. But they had to have pulled his shoulders out of socket to get him where they needed to be on the cross. All of my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It melted in the midst of my bowels. Verse 15, my strength is dried up like a pot shirt. Listen to this. Do you remember reading this in the Gospels? My tongue cleaveth to my jaws. Remember? I thirst. I thirst. I need something to drink. All for the purpose of uttering the last words. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And it is finished. It says, And thou hast brought me in to the dust of death. So you can see that long before Christ even came, the prophets spoke of Him and His crucifixion. What about other things throughout the Old Testament that would have symbolized death on a cross? Every offering pointed to Him. Every altar that was ever built pointed to the cross. Abraham offering his own son Isaac on an altar was a picture of his only begotten son. You see that? And then he would provide a lamb instead of man being able to do it. God would provide on His own. A perfect picture of what God was going to do through Jesus Christ. What about Judah, the the brother of Joseph? 
You remember this story? When Benjamin, they lied about Benjamin, Joseph did. He set, set him up to make, he wanted to see if his brothers had changed. And not Joseph and his brothers, but Joseph in the Bible and his brothers. So Benjamin, they, Joseph had some people put something in Benjamin's bag. It made it look like Benjamin had stolen from Pharaoh. And so they grabbed him, took him, locked him up in prison. And this is beautiful. Judah, not any of the other tribes, not Levi, where all the priests would come from, but Judah would come and say, let me replace him, even though I'm not guilty, I'll take his place. I wonder why God chose Jesus to be the line of the tribe of Judah when we see the substitutionary work that Christ would display one day by taking our place in our prison on our cross. And it's all been there. It's painted all throughout Scripture. And people just refuse to see it, I guess. The list goes on and on. So Jesus died on a cross because it was the most horrific way to represent everything God wanted to accomplish through atonement and sacrifice for sin and to fulfill the prophecies of His Word. Last one, the resurrection. The final part of this teaching will be about the resurrection and what it represents for me and you. And I want to clarify some things at the beginning of this. We can never place the resurrection ahead of the crucifixion. No death, no resurrection. There's people out there today that teach we're resurrection people. We don't bother with the cross. Friend, you can't have a resurrection without a death. They say, well, if we speak of the death, we're speaking of, of something that happened in the past. Man, the death is what brought us everything. You just heard the entire discourse of why God needed to do what needed to be done through Christ. And so the resurrection is still a vital part of what we believe, though. But keep in mind that if the focal point, and this is what I tell people, if the focal point was the resurrection, then every animal would have came back to life. The focal point was what? The death. The shedding of the blood, right? Innocence for guilt. Life of the flesh poured out for offering. Atonement for the soul. So we know that He resurrected, and I shouldn't have to point you to Scripture for that. Go to the Gospels. You'll see it at the end of the Gospels. and Just read those or the book of Acts or the book of Revelation. You'll see Him in a full form of resurrection and revelation. But I do want to address why the resurrection holds importance for me and you as a believer. Number one, it's the proof. The proof of what? The resurrection proved that Jesus did what He set out to do. What does that mean, preacher? If Jesus did not cover one sin, He could not have got out of the grave. So the fact that they've never found the body of Jesus Christ because it resurrected meant that Satan's never going to be able to find a sin and hold us guilty for those of us that believe. It's exactly what it is. It is the proof. Well, I want proof that God's real. The resurrection's the proof. He got out of the grave. They can't find Him. You can't visit His memorial because He's not there. He's up there. He's ascended. And He's exalted to the right hand of God. The resurrection is the proof that Jesus did what He came for. Second thing is the glorified body. The Bible says that Jesus is the first fruits of all things for me and you. So if Jesus didn't receive a glorified body, we can't receive a glorified body. He received a glorified body. You can read about it in Scripture. There's many times He would come through doors or walls with locked doors and He would present Himself to the disciples and all of those things, but He was in a glorified body. So we don't know what we are going to be like, Scripture says. I heard them talking about this in Sunday school this morning. I was grinning because I was like, you know, you have no idea what you're doing. You're teaching my stuff that I'm going to be teaching on tomorrow night, but that's how the Holy Ghost works. And so we don't know what we'll be like, but we know we'll be like Him. We will receive a glorified body. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Thessalonians chapter 4. Read it. There's a celestial body. There's a spiritual body. It's all there. I like that. What does the resurrection also guarantee? Last thing, it guarantees heaven. You do realize, if we're reading this chronologically, in John 14, verses 1, down to about verse 6, when Jesus says, I go to do what? Prepare a place. You do realize that he had to die and then go prepare. I don't know how grand heaven's going to be. We can't even know I has seen and no ear has heard. Neither does the heart of man have in store what God has waiting for them that love him. But here's what I know. Jesus said, when I die and I'm glorified, I'm going to go there 
and build something for you. I don't know if it took him 2,017 years to do it, but if it did, it's going to be something grand. I'm sure just like in the beginning, he could just create it. But the fact that he's going there and making sure that he's preparing something for us and making sure that it's going to be the best that he could ever do and that he's overseeing that project ought to make you swell with pride, child of God, because he's thought about you that much in detail to go away and prepare a place. It's amazing. With everything else, the prophets foretold the resurrection also. Do you know that? In Scripture, the prophets talked about the resurrection. Last rattle of Scripture right here, and we're out of here. Told you I had a lot, but I think I did really good tonight on this, as far as time-wise for all the material. Psalm 1610 says this. Those of you that are students of the Word of God, you'll know Psalm 16 and 11 is one of my favorite verses. And uh, in thy presence is fullness of joy at thy hand treasures. Right hand treasures forevermore. Psalm 1610 says this. Thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither will you suffer thine holy one to see corruption. This does not mean that Jesus had to be born again. What it simply means is that when he died, what did he tell them that he was going to do? Remember they were asking, what is the son going to be, Redeemer? What is it going to be, Messiah, Teacher? He said, just as Jonah was in the belly of the well for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man go into the belly of the earth. It's what it's speaking of here. It's not talking about the burning side of hell. It's speaking of paradise, that he would go down into that location. And Tartarus, the location of the prison where the fallen angels had been locked up with Lucifer, and he would speak to them. But it's saying he would leave him in death. He would be resurrected one day in glory. How do we know it's speaking of Jesus? Thine Holy One capitalized. He's speaking of the Son of God, that when he died, he would not be left there to rot or see corruption, he would be resurrected in all of his glory and his grandeur. Psalm 110 and 1 says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. How can he sit at the right hand of God in heaven if he hasn't been resurrected? Think about it. Psalm 2 and 7, I will declare this decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my, capital letter S, thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. Speaking of what he was going to do in his death and in his resurrection, making sure that everyone knows. And this is actually, the reason I put this in here is it's quoted in Acts 13 by the apostles. Listen to what it says. God has fulfilled the same to the children in that he raised up Jesus again. What is that? Resurrection. He raised up Jesus again, as it is written in the second psalm. Look at this. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Speaking of his resurrection. So Psalm 2 and 7 is a direct reference to God resurrecting his son from the dead. The apostles preached it that way. That it was spoken of. What about the oldest book of the Bible? The book of Job. What? Yeah, it's the oldest book. It's very possible that Job was a contemporary of Moses. And it could be that Moses penned the book of Job as Job told him the story. Because in Scripture, when you look at the lineage, Issachar, one of the sons of Jacob, tribe of Israel, if you look in the list of his sons, one of those names is Job. It's very possible that in the journeys of the wilderness, or maybe when they met back in Egypt before they left, that Job said, let me tell you a story, Moses. And he starts telling him of everything that went on. Job 19.25, I like this scripture. Job said this, I know that my Redeemer dieth. No, he liveth. And he shall do what? Stand at the latter day upon the earth. How's he going to stand at the latter day if he wasn't resurrected after he died on a cross and he was buried? Job has some good insight, man. You get to reading over in Job, I think it's about the 14th chapter. He actually speaks that if a man die, shall he live again? And he starts speaking of the resurrection. It's amazing when you read what God put into that man. Zechariah chapter 12, last scripture. Say amen to that. That was the loudest amen all night. This is the last one. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. Did he speak of the resurrection? I will pour upon the house of David. You know Jesus came through the lineage of David, right? 
That's what it said it had to happen. He had to be the son of David. had to sit on the throne. David's throne would be exalted for all generations, speaking of Christ, being the one that would come from that. And upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. Now we know that grace only comes from one source, and it's Christ. But look, they will look upon me whom they have pierced. This is one for the crucifixion and the resurrection. And they'll mourn for me as one mourns. <laughs> this is so specific. For his only son. And she'll be in bitterness for him as one that is bitterness for his firstborn. They'll look on him whom they pierced. What do you think that's speaking of? The death on a cross. But they're not just looking at him at that. It says that he's going to be standing there after that. And they're going to look on him. They're actually going to ask him, if you keep reading Zechariah, how did you get those scars? He's going to say, I was wounded in the house of my friends. That's what it says. After his death, I was wounded in the house of my friends. Jesus resurrected because Scripture said He had to resurrect. He resurrected to give us those great truths that our sin had been wiped away. It's the evidence. You ever want proof that He ain't found Him yet? That's all the proof you need. You're getting a glorified body. We got the promise of heaven. But the prophets prophesied and they spoke that He would indeed get out of the grave. And so He did. These five things make up what I think is the doctrine of Christ. Did you get all of those? The deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. The virgin birth was a part of that. His sinless life. The sacrifice. And the resurrection. Those are the vital parts of Christianity that we must, we must believe if we're going to continue to be saved or someone is ever going to get saved. Yes, I will make my notes available to you because I know there was a lot there. So I'll make copies of those. We got through that tonight. Hallelujah. I hope it gave you some good stuff. Did you enjoy that tonight? I hope so. And, um, and I know that the devil did not want me to do this because I started about 7 Friday morning and didn't get done until about 10.30 Friday night. Things just kept happening and kept happening and kept happening all day long. And I didn't get done until late, late that night. But God's faithful and we got it done. And so... Amen. I will have notes ready for you in just a moment. Y'all bow your heads with me. Father, we love you and we thank you for these people. We thank you for what you've done in our lives. And Lord, we can't hear about the doctrine of Christ without saying thank you for your Son. Thank you what He's done for us, Lord. Thank you for what you allowed Him to do and what He chose to do. And even though we may not understand all the dynamics of that, because some of it has to be received by faith. But God, we do see these things that are in Scripture revealed to us. And we thank You for what it represents and what it guarantees and what it assures every believer when we trust You. So God, I'm asking that we continue to learn this. Let us hide this in our hearts. Let us teach this, disciple with it, help others learn these deep truths of Christianity so we can make sure that people can see the truth for what it is. And just like it says, that truth will make them free. So Lord, be with us and help us in, this, in that venture. God, go with us tonight as we leave out of here in safety. Bless your people. Let us have a good time tomorrow as we fellowship in our nation as a national holiday. But God, don't let us forget those that are in tragedy even though we have time off. So Lord, let us take time out of our day tomorrow to remember them in prayer and to take time out to make sure that we're seeking for their behalf and being intercessors for them. Again, turn that storm away. You did it with Elijah where you dried up the earth for three and a half years. We're not asking for a drought, but we're asking for your intervention. And so turn that storm, Lord, and do a mighty work. We know there's many praying across this nation for that very thing. And so God, hear our cries tonight and move on this nation and show mercy. We thank you again for your son and all that he's done for us. We ask it all in his holy name. Amen. God bless you. If you want notes, I will have them available directly if you're willing to wait for them. God bless you. Hug somebody's neck tonight on the way out of here.